Welcome to Muslims and Mental Health with Sister Heather, a groundbreaking program looking at mental health issues through the biopsychosocial spiritual paradigm. Hello and welcome today to another episode of Muslims and Mental Health. Today we're going to talk about the sexual dif- dysfunctions that men and women face and how sex changes as people age. I'll be joined today by Dr. Isan Garajadagi. He is a clinical psychologist with a specialization in couples and sexual relationships, and he's also the founder of TherapyCable.com. Uh, people seem to want and need to be close to others, and as we grow older, many of us also want to continue to have an active and satisfying sex life but the aging process can cause some changes. So today, Dr. G is going to um, talk with us and and inform us about how we can maintain that lifestyle and inform us about some of the sexual dysfunctions that exist. So please welcome Dr. G with me. Hello. Hello, Dr. G. Um, Thank you for joining us today. We're honored to have you. Thank you. Um, I would like to just start by asking you, can you tell our viewers what makes Uh, something asexual dysfunction? Yes, basically a sexual dysfunction uh, can be uh, defined in many different ways. If we go by the book, if you will, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that is being used in the field of psychiatry and psychotherapy and and medicine uh, for diagnostic purposes, then there are a few categories of sexual dysfunction for men and women. They're different based on certainly their sexuality. Uh, As we know, men and women have different, uh, uh, you know, organs, if you will, sexual organs, and and also their body as well as their mind and their hormones and their emotions and thoughts, they're quite unique to to the gender and to the sex, meaning their uh, natural uh, born, if you will, uh, composition of 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 uh, organically who they are and how they function. So, they, those categories really address more or less the ability to have a healthy and satisfying sexual experience. And as you can imagine, it can relate to these areas that we mentioned. In in terms of sex uh, and having a sexual relationship. There are certain stages or phases really that people have to actually go through in order to finally have a have had a a gratifying sexual experience the very first thing really starts with attraction and and then after that we have some kind of a desire to want to be in a uh, you know romantic or sensual or sexual relationship and then there is an, a, a state or phase of arousal. That's where not only the mind is ready, but also the body follows through and, and becomes ready as well. For instance, we have increased uh, and raised heartbeat and pulse and uh, blood circulation by, you know, because basically the, the body organs have to be ready for a certain activity. So, the, so our mind and body and hormones collaborate and in a harmonious way to, for the whole body to, and, and mind to experience something with another person. And then after that, we really have the act, if you will, uh, to people engage with one another in an experience, which we call sex or sexual experience, which includes a kind of a mind-body connection, if you will, and a lot of people also uh, throw in a, a, a spiritual connection in there too. And uh, then, uh, as like many other performance activities, if you think about it, just like jogging or walking or swimming or playing tennis, you cannot go forever. <laughs> this has to end because it's strenuous. It, it is a lot of body activity involved, physical activities, so which puts a strain on both the mind and the body, so it has to end. And and it comes to more or less a phase where all these heightened uh, activities or arousal and uh, performance-related actions, they have to wind down and kind of come back to a very kind of a peaceful or normal state of of being. So through this, and then it can start again. So it can become a circular um, uh, pattern and, uh, and then... It really depends on the people and and the two people involved in this interaction, their stamina, their their physical health, their 
uh, if you will, uh, even whether they have had enough sleep or not, you know, if they're fatigued, how much energy they have, and also other mental things, for instance, if they're worrying about things or, or not, if they're in a, a peaceful mindset to just relax and, and take it easy. So uh, based on those multiple characteristics and factors, a, a person has to go through this uh, almost like a wave le- wavelength or wave-like uh, process of a heightened arousal and then uh, really coming back to a status quo, to a peaceful state, and um, and then continue that for a while until they decide, okay, this is this has had this has been a gratifying experience. Now, uh, the issues with uh, this function that we need to look at are sim- simply, um, I would say, lack or deficits in some of these areas. For instance, if there is a deficit in uh, desire, if somebody uh, used to have desire but suddenly doesn't have desire. So they're wondering what happened, what is going on, how come I don't have any desire anymore. So that could fall into one of these categories of what we call a uh, hyposexual desire disorder, which is uh, low desire, if you will. And um, uh, and also arousal. Arousal, as I mentioned earlier, has to do more with the body being ready uh, than, than the mind. You know, the mm-hmm. desire already indicates the mind is kind of ready. Mm-hmm. And uh, certainly we could, uh, we could uh, apply the concept of arousal to mind as well. But mostly when we are talking about arousal, we are talking about what I mentioned earlier, blood circulation more or less for both men and women, mm-hmm. for their body to be available and ready. There's actually changes that take place both in the body of a woman and a, a man. Uh, to really uh, to to be at their best, if you will, to experience this, ex- this sexual interaction to the uh, fullest extent and in a safe um, uh, manner. So, uh, and some people may not be become or get to that level of arousal. They used to, but no longer uh, are they able to get there. So that can also be categorized as a uh, as a little bit of a dysfunction. Then uh, certainly there is some uh, at the, toward the end, if you will, or even throughout the act of sexual experience, a lot of times the duration and uh, the intensity of the interaction becomes an uh, area of focus, uh, as you can imagine, and, and people who are older, perhaps they can relate to this concept that I want to bring up, which is, you know, when we used to be much younger, let's say in, their, in our 20s, you know, teenage years and 20s, the body is full of er, energy. It's bursting with energy. So we certainly uh, remember, you know, the times where we engaged in a uh, much longer duration of anything, whether it was running, swimming, playing basketball, or, or any other activity, or even sex. But then as the body ages, and, and as, as we age as human beings, we see that this duration may change instead of being able to let's say, perform in an activity for um, what used to be an hour, we simply uh, feel and catch ourselves not being able to continue after 20 minutes. So this also, uh, this this kind of duration, which generally is called as performance, or, or more or less a duration of interaction, of sexual interaction, can also become the subject of inquiries. Like, how long does it last? Why can people last longer or shorter? And has there been a change in their performance from the past experience to current experience? So that can also become a dysfunction, you know, uh, where people may look at it. Oh, you know, I no longer can uh, last for an hour or or whatnot. So so there must be a deficit. There must be something that I need to look at to fix. When we talk about dysfunction, what are we talking about? This no function, right? Mm -hmm. Or lack of function or, or, or damaged function, if you will. So what used to be is no longer working. So just to clarify, um, so are you likening this then to the stages of development? So that, is it that when people are younger, I mean, you use the analogy of other, like sports and things like that, performance, um, that they they can expect 
normally to have a longer duration and then as they get older it may wane a little bit or yes is that but inaccurate? not universally not mm -hmm. uh, that is not the case for everyone mm -hmm. because there are also many younger people who also struggling mm -hmm. with the with any of these phases you know okay. it could be some for instance duration because when it comes to the dysfunction we have to actually look at four qualifiers one is what we call a lifelong a problem, mm -hmm. which uh, the problem, which means that the problem has existed forever. Mm -hmm. There was no time, uh, any time during the life of a person that the problem was not present. Okay. So it's lifelong versus acquired. Mm -hmm. So sexual dysfunctions are uh, called acquired if there was a better performance or better version of it available before, and suddenly that let's say intensity or quality dropped. That's acquired since an event or age or a time. Uh, that's something we can look at. And then uh, one is the, the other two factors we need to look at is situational versus generalized. Uh, so, for, for instance, a person may, exp may be able to have desire mm -hmm. uh, with one person but not with others. Mm -hmm. So that is a situational example versus a person may fi suddenly find themselves, you know, having no desire for anyone, anything, mm -hmm. anybody. And that, that is more generalized. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it certainly, uh, so to answer your question, it's not necessarily always following the developmental stages, mm -hmm. but certainly when it comes to uh, one, you know, stage, I would say, which is more or less the um, late teens, early 20s, but also coinciding with the um, identity formation stage of, you know, Erickson's model. Uh, we could say that sexuality should be at its peak um, for for majority of people. Now, that also changes f based on gender. For instance, we, we know that, again, uh, it's not just the physical aspect of sex that we want to look at. For instance, a lot of women, they may actually report that the peak of their sexuality is more in their 40s mm -hmm. rather than in their 20s because it's not only the physical experience that counts, but also their, their that, you know, emotional, spiritual, if you will, also that mind social, body connection the mind-body connection that they experience. So uh, so it really is a very complex thing, and it doesn't go exactly one-on-one -on -one with the developmental stages. Okay. Um, that, that's great, because you bring me to my next question, which is uh, to distinguish between the genders, right? Yeah. If there are particular dysfunctions that are more relatable to men or to sure. women. So, you know, are there specific sexual dysfunctions that men encounter in their lifetime that are pe peculiar to men? Yes, well, for men, it is mostly... Um, I would say there are a few categories we need to look at. As, as you can imagine, a, a man's uh, sexual performance is kind of contingent on a very uh, distinct physical activity. And therefore, uh, desire and arousal are uh, paramount. You know, if a man cannot feel desire and is not aroused, he cannot engage in a sexual activity to the fullest extent. Mm -hmm. Basically, in other words, he cannot have intercourse. He can have other types of uh, sexual experiences, but that can affect his uh, identity, it can affect his uh, ego, if you will, or self-esteem, it can ha affect his emotional state, mm -hmm. it can create anxiety for him. Uh, so desire and arousal are very important for men, and they are also linked to other things such as, let's say, level of testosterone, hormone, hormonal level. Uh, and this is something we do uh, observe for men above 35 or 40, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of the, 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 the level of testosterone drops in at that age, more or less. And for some people, it doesn't. They, they may have the same level up until they're 70, 80 or die. Mm -hmm. But generally, you know, in majority of cases, the testosterone level drops. And when that, when that occurs, there's also a change in the level of desire and arousal. Certainly another aspect is the aging process, uh, that uh, really kind of deterioration of our body over time. Cell uh, damage mm -hmm. leads to uh, less of an ability to keep an arousal, for instance, for a longer period of time, 
or to the same intensity that they used to. Therefore, uh, again, that may affect a man's sexual uh, experience and performance. Um, and, and again, like I mentioned, it affects other things, not only the, the act of sex, but also, let's say, his self-esteem, his self-confidence mm -hmm. about having or uh, pursuing a sexual relationship with, a per with another person. So, so with that, what are some of the signs that you would suggest that men look for if they feel like they're having a problem of some sort? Well, the signs, uh, you know, they're multifold. Again, because it is so complex, we could uh, certainly, uh, and on one area, it's lack of desire. Mm -hmm. You know, if they suddenly, after a while, they feel like they don't really have that much desire to have sex anymore. Okay, well, it, we would be able to look at it. Is it psychologically related? Is it hormonally related? Is it a uh, stage of, uh, you know, development or age basically related? Uh, sometimes it is linked to injuries. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, we know that back injuries, spinal cord injuries, and so forth have a huge effect on a man's ability to um, get aroused. And therefore, that's something that we have to look at as well. Mm -hmm. Stress. Stress has a lot to do with uh, a man has, uh, with a man's desire and, again, arousal. So, um, but... I would say uh, drops, a drop in arousal, a drop in desire, an ability to uh, you know, perform or last in a sexual relationship. Those are signs that they can uh, kind of not get worried about, but once it happens, really kind of inquire what is going on. Mm -hmm. They would simply go uh, to a urologist, to a general practitioner, to a psychologist, to a mm -hmm. sex therapist, um, even neurologist, if you will, and, and kind of get an idea of what do you think is going on with my current situation. And also uh, not freak out about it. You know, mm -hmm. that again, kind of try to accept certain changes in a person's sexuality. That's what I'm hoping with our episode here, that we're educating people in a way mm -hmm. that maybe they didn't have the information before to sort of less, lessen their stress yeah. and inform them in a way that will help them to seek the help that they yeah. need in this regard. Exactly. Or just to be aware of this might happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so like you said, not to freak out, not yes. to, to get uneasy, but that, to accept that this might be just something normal. Um, I do want to continue on with you to talk sure. about the women, uh, but at this time we're going to take a short break for our sponsor and we'll be right back. Hi, welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery and my name is Yvette Kuglin and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time, we don't even know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So, we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Welcome back to Muslims and Mental Health. Today we are discussing um, sexual dysfunctions and sex as we age with Dr. G. Uh, we left off our discussion talking about gender and sexual dysfunctions, so we're going to continue now talking about women and are there particular dysfunctions that are peculiar to women uh, and and what we can do about them. Absolutely. So we, uh, we covered the more or less the men's sexual dysfunction. For women, uh, too, interestingly, we are kind of talking about the same categories or phases, but really simply organically in a different fashion. And, uh, but a woman can have lack of desire. You know, they, they used to have a lot of desire, but suddenly that uh, drops. Or at times also you get women who never have had desire, and then they're wondering about that. Like, how come other women have desire and I don't have desire? Mm -hmm. That's an issue, a very, very complex issue that is more gender uh, and sex-oriented, meaning... There is something called a sexual dimorphism. We can talk about that later on in terms of how our body and mind neuropsychology is 
you know, determining a very specific predisposition toward a, uh, the, an area of human experience such as desire that is particularly and distinctly different between men and women. Mm -hmm. So uh, in generally, for instance, women don't necessarily have to have desire in order to create arousal. That's a very interesting neurobiological thing, meaning desire can follow arousal rather than um, have to precede this uh, the arousal. So that's a very important concept we can talk about later. So it's really not a dysfunction. It's more or less a misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. And the other part is, yes, women also can experience fluctuations in arousal. So again, arousal is body getting ready. There is hormonal, physiological changes, and that may change over time. And then lead to sometimes, you know, not only discomfort within the sexual experience, but also pain or damage. So mm -hmm. that's something that has to be looked at. And then uh, lastly, you know, being able to uh, really kind of get a gratifying experience from the sexual uh, interaction, uh, that too is something that women uh, sometimes struggle with and also bring to the, to the let's say, office of a physician or psychologist. How come I'm not getting enough, let's say, pleasure from mm -hmm. this uh, experience and compared to other people, who are women who report that. And also there is an area of uh, that's specifically unique to women, which is called PGAD or persistent genital arousal disorder, which is pain-related mm -hmm. uh, problem or you know, the, the kind of a category of pain-related issues that are more op occur more often in women than men. Uh, so there are these, at least these four categories, I would say, that people, we need to look at. And following your uh, question, that you had mentioned about uh, signs that people need to look at. Again, if women experience certain changes, fluctuations, drops in any of these categories, or they're wondering about whether or not something is in order, if you will, uh, then they can, like I mentioned earlier, really seek the advice of a again, urologist, neurologist, um, psychologist, you know, general practitioners, or sex therapists to educate themselves, get some ideas, not necessarily worry about it too much and, and, and accept the fact that sex is not a universal standard in terms of everywhere being the same and same shape and format and intensity for everyone in the world. It's something to actually, it's a unique collaborative experience to be negotiated between mm -hmm. two people. And even before we get there, we have to negotiate it within ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have to come to terms with the limits and opportunities of sexual experience within our own self. You know, there is a concept of a intra-psychic or intra-personal uh, sexuality, which means my own relationship with my own sexuality, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of uh, other persons being involved. And then there is that concept of interpersonal. Uh, or interrelational or interactional uh, sexuality, which then requires another person to be involved. Mm -hmm. These are two different kinds of two different, uh, I would say, spheres or levels of functioning. So and that's why it's so, it's so complex. And I think that's something that you touched on already kind of demonstrates that need for both the intra and the inter, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because you mentioned like men's testosterone sort of waning around 35 and later. Yes. And then women perhaps being more interested in their 40s. Yes. So the timing there is the a little timing. off. So how uh -huh. you, just, you already have to negotiate, it yes. sounds like, um, just on the biological aspect Absolutely. of, of um, yes. this, this issue. So that kind of leads us to our next set of questions, which are about couples. Mm -hmm. And that we know how sex changes as couples age. And so we want to know how it changes and why does it change, mm -hmm. which we kind of alluded to already, yes. but, um, and why should people care about these changes that happen? Absolutely. Well, certainly, as, as we talked about earlier, the most important change, I would say, is hormonal change. And for, we mentioned for men, testosterone level changes. But for women, it is, uh, you know, more or less um, estrogen levels and, and uh uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, complexity of hormones actually changing, which ultimately culminates in, in menopause. And um, so it, it's very complex. And therefore, these hormonal changes have, uh, we know, they have direct effect on arousal. 
and on the body, you know, the way, because arousal is actually directed by hormones. You know, that's how arousal happens. And when there is a fluctuation in this uh, composition of both male and female hormones, then, uh, but at different stages, for instance, for women, it's, uh, you know, it's not necessarily at 35, if you will, or, or 40. It can happen a little bit earlier or a little bit later in, in, in life. Mm -hmm. And for men, it is a little bit off as well. But, and again, it depends on the person, because for one person, it may not happen until they're like 60 or 70. Mm -hmm. So individually, we have to look at these hormonal changes individually that occur with age, but also not, you know, outside of hormonal changes, f the physiology mm -hmm. of the body changes, which means that uh, muscle strength, you know, the longevity and uh, durability and uh, more or less um, uh, the, the strength of cells, uh, you know, muscle cells. Muscles, uh, they, they, they consist of cells and, and, and bloodstream, you know, the cardiovascular system, the, the, the heart and the veins and the arteries and, and blood flow to the cells. All of this is a very complex and also neur neurons, mm -hmm. neuropathways and uh, uh, neurobiological connection between all, all these different systems of the body they have to be at their peak in order to really deliver the results. But as we know, as we age, all of these systems deteriorate. Mm -hmm. The cardiovascular system gets weaker. The muscles, this muscle, musculoskeletal system gets weaker. We, we you know, develop osteoporosis. We develop mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of muscle uh, aches and pains and, and uh, you know, joints and uh, all kinds of problems, physiological problems mm -hmm. and, and neurological problems as well. So when over time all these if you will cell damage on a cellular level all this cell damage accumulates to a point that has a uh, cumulative result which is a, a dysfunction or, or lower function of what used to be mm -hmm. and uh, now what we have to do about this is really first of all accept the fact that sexuality and sexual experience it, it cannot persist at a constant level. Mm -hmm. It is just like um, any other physical activity. The best analogy is physical activity. When we are in our teenage years, again, the late teens, early 20s, at kind of a peak of our physical activity, uh, we can run marathons, you know, and we can run very fast. We can be very agile. We can, you know, climb up walls and, you know, jump off trees and things like that. But when you're in your 40s and 50s, you no longer can do that. It's, you know, it's just we have to accept that, that change. We no longer are capable and able to do, engage in these intense activities. Same goes with sex. Mm -hmm. You know, sexual activity cannot be uh, the intensity and quality, duration, um, you know, and strength of it cannot be maintained and sustained throughout all our lives up until we die. So, and, and it starts right around mid 30s for mm -hmm. both men and women, probably closer to end of 40s. And right after 40 years of age, there is considerable change that mm -hmm. we'd really need to, to come to terms with. We have to accept that things aren't like they used to, but it is okay. That's the other, I think our expectations of things to continue are the real problem. Mm -hmm. If we don't expect things continue the way they used to, and we come to accept that, okay, things have changed, so now let us negotiate a new protocol, then things are going to be okay. I mean, it raised a question for me as you were talking about it, um, how sometimes people, when they reach uh, mid-age or around 40, they mm -hmm. have, you know, a midlife crisis right. in pop culture, right? Or they feel that, uh, I want to get back to that exercise yeah. that I did when I was 20. 20. Um, yeah. Do you think they have similar attitudes about sex as well? Like, you know, I need to be doing more of this or yeah. uh, quality or something. Do you think that they experience that as well? Uh, and in fact, even more. Mm -hmm. Not only that it is very similar, but it's even more intensified. And there are reasons for that. First of all, uh, sexual health... Uh, has two other components that physical health doesn't. One is sexual health also relates to, if you will, uh, very much a person's, I would say, you know, another aspect of their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. like if they're still um, valuable. If they still you know, have it. They still have it. They're still valuable. They're still uh -huh. attractive. They're still desirable. They're mm -hmm. still capable uh, in, in that aspect of desirability, of value, worth, mm -hmm. worthiness which physical activity may not necessarily have. You know, a person may no longer be that physically active, but not affect their value and worth and say, okay, well, I'm less agile. I'm less mm -hmm. active. It is fine. I'm still a very valuable, worthy person. Mm -hmm. But when, if it is our, when it comes to our sexuality, that may affect, hmm, you know, am I still somebody who can be desirable? Someone else want me, more or less. So that's one aspect. The other one, is because, again, of the interpersonal aspect of sexuality, uh, usually sex is a major component of a relationship. Mm -hmm. So if a person's sexuality deteriorates, they may get quite frightened about the quality or longevity of their relationship with, an, with mm -hmm. their partner. So it may threaten the future of that relationship as well as, again, uh, almost like the level of acceptance, approval, um, and, and um, appreciation within the relationship. So the future of the relationship suddenly becomes the most paramount problem. It's like, oh, what is going to happen to us? Mm -hmm. It's no longer an individual thing. Suddenly it transfers into the realm of interpersonal, mm -hmm. relational thing. So it can be quite frightening and... Uh, uh, and kind of put into jeopardy a lot of other things than what the person is mm -hmm. uh, dealing with personally. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, family, for instance, also finances. Let's say somebody is, wor somebody, someone uh, who is in a relationship, they have had good sexual relationships, suddenly that changes, that may not only reduce their self-esteem, but also bring up questions about their relationship, which may be true and in fact lead to separation and divorce and suddenly that has material effects mm -hmm. you know okay what happens to my house and finances or uh, investments or mm -hmm. but, and then also in addition to that what happens to our future let's say as a family mm -hmm. the notion of family is now endangered as well so it can be, become very complex I would think, though, on the upside of that, you know, what you mentioned before about the mind-body connection, and if people are attending to their intrapsychic uh, work as they age and mm -hmm. become hopefully filled with wisdom or yeah. <laughs> wiser, that that might enhance the relationship as people get older in terms of the That's the right. mind aspect to it. So where the physical may deteriorate in some way, that uh, the quality maybe is better from that mm -hmm. um, planning aspect or that mind-body connection, the entire like holistic, the holistic experience. Yes. Is that well, correct? Or? Yes. I mean, in most cases, that's exactly what happens, meaning that hopefully if there is enough and effective, uh, you know, connection, so if the bond is strong between the couples and uh, the partners in the couple uh, and... Uh, if there is a, at least an effective way of communication between them, then uh, and, and kind of the almost similar levels of ability, such as intellectual, emotional, um, interactional, social, spiritual levels of functioning is quite similar, or not, not too similar, but close, then they can negotiate, they can really come to a more deeper understanding of what is going on between them that simply the fact that the sexual relationship has been deteriorating or the quality of it has changed uh, does not necessarily define the entire relationship and they can really strengthen other areas and even that deteriorating part of their relationship coming to negotiate a new way and protocol of interacting with one another then that can really lead to a much more sensible and meaningful bond and connection between them. Mm -hmm. In most cases, that's what happens. But in some cases, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Because again, one partner really is on a, if you will, a different trajectory in their lives. Let's say their path of self-actualization is different than, their, than the other partner. And throughout the years, they have not been really able to establish a close level of or close bond as well as 
a um, effective way of communicating. Mm -hmm. So te technically, their their path, their paths kind of cross and then part from each other, and uh, and, and and that is also to be accepted. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work for one or both people. They would really hopefully find a way of amicably separating and kind of finding their own unique ways. So how in that negotiation process, how would you suggest that couples talk to each other about this issue? Well, t talking about this is not easy mm -hmm. because uh, as you can imagine, uh, sexuality has to do with a lot of private uh, areas of experience. So. A person's emotions, that's paramount, that's kind of the core issue. And on top of that, f uh, you know, the physical aspect of a person's life is um, under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. And there is a, so there is a lot of vulnerability, meaning that a person may have to reveal a lot more about themselves, both emotionally and physically, uh, than, than they are used to. And if, as soon as there is a change between what we are used to and what needs to happen, people experience anxiety. Mm -hmm. And there, there are lots of strong emotions uh, resurface, such as shame and guilt and embarrassment and uh, almost fears of, let's say, lots of things like abandonment or, um, or, or other things. Uh, so because of this, this sensitivity of this kind of almost like transitional uh, phase from... Uh, being a complete private person and then having to reveal oneself in these mm -hmm. areas and and for the private information to become a little bit of more of a public information, even though it is between two people, it has trans it has been transferred from a complete secrecy to a less secrecy and more uh, transparency, and that is difficult for people to talk about. So, uh, for many reasons, not only that we are overwhelmed by emotions at that moment, but also we lack vocabulary and skills to talk about these important mm -hmm. things. People don't know what words to use. People don't know, and as soon as they use a word that is tr used to describe a certain experience, whether it is, again, physical or emotional experience, uh, it may become too intense, not only for the speaker, but also for the listener. I and can then, see how people would feel um, afraid that they might be judged for their absolutely. statements or absolutely. how they feel like, was the person going to think I'm this or that, or, you know, in a exactly. negative way. Exactly. Um, That's right. So then, you know, what do you think might be signs, if a couple is trying to have this conversation, that they would need to get assistance from a third party? or? Absolutely. I would certainly really reach out to um, really sex therapists because even uh, therapists, uh, psychotherapists or psychologists who have not had a specialization in sex therapy, uh, even them, uh, you know, they, they, they lack the skills uh, and vocabulary and the, the basically the tool set, if you will, or or a because uh, it seems like a very fine very, conversation. It's it's, a, it's very yeah. sensitive. You you have to know how to go about this, how to approach it. Uh, you have to be comfortable as a therapist to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. You have to have the um, you, you, when I say tool set, I mean, I mean kind of a, almost like a repository. I can go and reach in and pull out some techniques and, and suggestions and recommendations how to go about talking about these things. Mm -hmm. So most of it has to do with putting people at ease, mm -hmm. educating them, giving them tools and techniques to deal with the situation in a safe manner, and um, also uh, being able to regulate themselves. It's not only self-regulation, but also maybe regulating the relationship and the mm -hmm. partner. So rather than jumping to conclusions, judgments, um, even demands and expectations, we have to tread very lightly. It has to be uh, a very slow kind of a walk, one step in front of the other, you know, and so forth, to gradually go from zero to 60, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I would say that's why a sex therapist usually is more capable of talking about these things or training people to talk about these things. But also there are many therapists, psychotherapists, who specialize in sex therapy. Mm -hmm. That would be even more preferred way because 
not only they're capable of talking about and addressing sexual issues, but also they're very much by training, very much mindful of emotional issues mm -hmm. and relational issues that the pure sex therapist may not have been trained in. Mm -hmm. And so looking at the lifetime of a marriage or sexual relationship, mm -hmm. um, what would you recommend to couples around about talking and caring about their sexual lives? Well, what I would say that they should be really uh, open. They, they should try at, at least to each other. I mean, they don't have to go around and talk to everybody and anybody about their sexual life. And mm -hmm. uh, perhaps even they shouldn't, unless it's a specialist, if you will. And uh, but but toward each other, they should gradually develop a uh, more open communication, more tolerant and accepting and welcoming type of a communication. And, and affirmative, you know, something that can provide validity mm -hmm. and validation. I'm sorry, not validity, validation. <laughs> so validation would be more or less giving affirmation and, um, and basically uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, approval because it's not up to a partner to approve anything, but more of an understanding, Acceptance. empathic. Yeah. Not even accept, acceptance, uh, because acceptance too is a tricky thing. You know, you don't have to accept different things. You just have to understand them. Mm -hmm. You know, th that's the thing. Uh, we, uh, human beings have a very hard time with accepting things that are different. But they don't have a hard time with understanding them. Mm -hmm. that's the, so that's more like acknowledgement. Acknowledgement, yeah. exactly. Acknowledgement. Acknowledging, um, confirming that I understand what you're talking about, that this is sensitive that this is important to you uh, and not devaluing. Mm -hmm. That's the whole idea. We don't want to be in a, uh, at a communicational level where we are devaluing our partners, making fun of them, diminishing, um, putting them down or minimizing what is important to them. As long as we can communicate that, you know, these are, these are sensitive things. I may not be used to it. I have no idea how to talk about this, but I will not have a critical uh, stance toward this. I'm not going to be criticizing you for what you experience. I'm going to have an open mind to understand, tolerate, uh, acknowledge, um, validate what you're talking about because I, as your partner, want to be there for you mm -hmm. as a means of support and, and help me understand uh, things that are difficult for me to understand. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's the whole idea of we are different people. We are uniquely um, different people. Therefore, there's no way of us really automatically being in the shape and form and ability to click. Mm -hmm. That click needs to happen through a process of communication, of negotiation, of conveying messages back and forth and verifying that via feedback and um, again, like I said, kind of approximation. Like you, you may be far away from each other, but you take very, very small steps. And through this approximation, you gradually can come to a better understanding of the, the truth of things, the reality of things, rather than just staying with what we assume to be the case. And trying guessing in the dark. Like, exactly. Yeah. We don't want to guess in the dark. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Sure. And You're I think welcome. that we have um, just scratched the surface, I think, yes. on this topic. That's right. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, explore this further in further episodes. But for this episode today, I think we're going to conclude with these questions. We always have fun questions at the end of our interview okay. sessions. Wonderful. So um, I want to just ask you a few fun questions. Sure. Uh, who is your hero if you have one and why? My hero um, really is my mother, and the reason for that is that I have just seen her, uh, you know, from as early as I can remember, which is about five years old, you know, struggle in life. Mm -hmm. And she's been going through um, uh, hundreds of different difficulties that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, but she has come out victoriously, and I have watched her how, to, how she did that, and it really went back to her ability of almost like what we call mind over matter. Mm -hmm. You know, she always used her mind and to, to figure out solutions to problems, never gave up, and is still the same. And um, she's a wonderful person. So I learned every single day from her. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that's my, 
That's lovely. I Thank think you. a lot of people will like that answer. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your favorite concept and why? My favorite concept is uh, sexual dimorphism. Uh, you know, the, the differences between men and women and, and, and how we struggle with that. It's just amazing. If we understood this uh, cross-section between neurobiology, evolutionary psychology, uh, you know, uh, physiology, uh, psychology, emotional regulation, um, uh, social roles, uh, and, and, and philosophical, spiritual uh, growth, existential aspects, and the psychosocial developmental stages. If we kind of could understand what is happening to us and the, the struggle we experience simply based on being different as a as a organism in, in terms of the way um, you know we have been born really that's that's not in our hands if, if I was born as a man and uh, I couldn't have changed it so but it ha it comes with its uh, you know confined confining elements it, it's a, it has a structure to it that I can never change but that preordains certain things both success and failure in a lot of areas of functioning in life so that's so amazing to me. And unfortunately, because we don't have enough information and how this works, we struggle a lot. And mm -hmm. so most of our struggles are in vain, mm -hmm. really. If we understood how, uh, how this works, this sexual dimorphism works, we would have a lot less painful experience mm -hmm. with, with our partners, with our family, with our neighbors, with, our, uh, with people in the world. Oh, so our last question yeah. is, uh, what is your favorite word and why? My favorite word? Yeah. Um, my favorite word. I really never <laughs> have favored a word, <laughs> but <laughs> I think if I think about it now, uh, I would say love is mm. the favorite word. And the reason is that it is so complex that it just defies any explanation it's it's so hard to explain it and experience it and convey that message so uh, it's the most uh, most complex i think even beyond the word god if mm -hmm. you will i think love is the the, the most complex and most elusive it's like so uh, it, it defies any type of logic and um, our ability to define it so i think that's mm -hmm. that's a favorite one well, thank you very much. Sure, and this concludes this episode of Muslims and Mental Health. We do appreciate your feedback, your questions, your concerns, or any ideas you have about episodes you'd like to see in the future. You can email them to nafshealertherapy at gmail.com. That's N-A-F-S-H-E-A-L-E-R therapy at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us.